In this video lecture, we'll identify who are the key stakeholders in the motorsport industry. Most casual fans would think that only the drivers are the key stakeholders. And if you ask them the question, who are the key stakeholders, they would name off uh, various famous drivers uh, from various series. Some might even mention this guy here. When in fact, the key stakeholders are quite varied. Right here is just a list of all the various components required to put a car onto the track. That said, this list here contains a variety of key stakeholders, also uh, in the motorsport industry, that really don't have to do a thing with the automobile. So we can see that this industry is quite broad, and it's more than just the actual construction of a vehicle. Much of the content for this particular lecture uh, comes from a, a book called Motorsport Going Global, The Challenges Facing the World's Motorsport Industry. This particular graphic is from page three in the chapter titled The Global Motorsport Business, which highlights the key stakeholders in the motorsport industry. One of the challenges I have in designing these lectures is that there aren't a lot of textbooks available on the particular topic, motorsports. And so this is one of the uh, only uh, books out there that actually uh, covers motorsport from a very much an academic perspective and is very useful for this particular discussion. One of the drawbacks, however, of this particular book is that it focuses in on European or maybe more global racing series that we're not familiar with here uh, in the United States. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still useful for explaining the different stakeholders, but also the relationships between those stakeholders, how they have these mutual beneficial relationships, how, they, how one benefits from the other. And so we're going to begin by identifying the key, the core of motorsport, and that's the production of vehicles that then can be raced. Constructors and their suppliers are key to creating the motorsport vehicle. We'll also refer to this particular group as the automobile industry uh, in general. Uh, we're going to go ahead and throw out a key term, a uh, term you're going to hear a lot in the motorsport industry, especially in regards to constructors and their suppliers, and that's OEMs. These are original equipment manufacturers. So think of these as Honda, uh, Toyota, Ford, uh, but also the various suppliers of products. Um, so these OEMs can also be, for example, uh, Goodyear provides tires. So they would be a constructor or supplier uh, to the construction of a vehicle. So these range uh, from engines, aerodynamics, fuel, lubricants, tires, uh, what have you. But the key here is the uh, constructors and suppliers bring together the diverse range of those specialized suppliers that might be per uh, particular uh, parts or components to the overall vehicle. Key to this is these constructors then rely on those suppliers to come up with new technologies and they actually can use those new technologies uh, and improve the racing vehicle from those uh, technologies or they can just simply test them out uh, to see whether or not they'll uh, be compatible to uh, the passenger car under various stresses. A very simple quote to showcase the automobile industry's view of motorsport and or auto racing is from Walter Hayes, the former PR director for Ford Motor Company, who said the sport can drive the industry and the industry can drive the sport. And, and essentially what this says is the, the industry can benefit from sport, but also the sport, motorsport, couldn't obviously function without the automobile industry and them bringing new technologies to uh, larger audiences. Throughout the long history of motorsport, there's been a strong connection to the automobile industry. Very evident here in this photo of two guys having a chat while attending uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1932. Who are these guys? Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone, uh, famous for their vehicles and tires. And of course, they're at a racetrack. And so I think that really speaks volumes to how in the early times and continuing on, there's a strong connection between the industry and the sport. Here I have a quote uh, that's a metaphor for why the constructors or the suppliers or the auto industry would want and or need a competitive platform to test out new ideas. Essentially, why it might be a good thing to fail. And so this quote, I've missed over 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Who might have said this quote? the best basketball player ever, Michael Jordan. 
Now I'll introduce the role of the sanctioning body, our second key stakeholder in the motorsport industry. Sanctioning bodies are the governing organizations that provide the rules and the competitive platform for the constructors and suppliers uh, to showcase their products but also test their products. So these arrows between the two denote a relationship between the two in which they both benefit, a mutually beneficial relationship. And of course, the sanctioning body would not exist if it didn't have constructors and suppliers providing uh, that motorsport vehicle uh, for the racing series to then govern and create rules. So we see this cross relationship in which the sanctioning body helps to determine the location the, uh, of the motorsport events. Uh, they try to make sure that everything's safe, both pr participants and spectat uh, spectators, uh, but also to make sure that uh, the competition is fair. Uh, so that's the role of the sanctioning body. Uh, the uh, automobile industry uses the sanctioning body uh, to promote the research and development, or R&D, essentially their new technologies. And so essentially, a sanctioning body provides an environment for the constructors to compete with each other and also test out their different um, uh, ideas. Uh, a key term we're going to introduce right now, and that's called a technology transfer, which we can find in various industries, but we can definitely see it here in this connection between the automobile industry and various racing series. A technology transfer is a process of moving promising research ideas and developments from innovation to more wide-scale production. So you test out an idea like Michael Jordan. Sometimes you fail. That's okay. You know now you won't uh, fail again uh, with that with that idea. Uh, and so you use this environment to test out new ideas so that then eventually that idea can be uh, distributed to uh, a larger audience and uh, we can think of that as people will want to buy your car, which the automobile industry absolutely adores. And so we see another quote, we're in racing, strictly for business. Competition success was the cheapest way of selling cars. And this is obviously from uh, the founder of Bentley, a ve very famous uh, a luxury, uh, high-performance car manufacturer. We can also see the, the typical uh, quote that also can quickly summarize this is win on Sunday, sell on Monday. The idea that you're going to be able to test your product next to another one's. Fans are going to watch that. If you win then that's going to help boost your sales for your particular product. Uh, and so we see this pretty much in motorsport. This is where it's extremely relevant. Um, where other sports, you know, maybe basketball, you test out new shoes, maybe kind of, sort of, uh, that might eventually reach to a mass market. But in the case of motorsport, you see that direct connection between the sport and the automobile industry. And once again, I'm going to go back to this particular graphic because it's a nice summary of these key stakeholders, and we can find the regulation of the sport up there in the top left-hand corner of this particular um, of, of figure. Here's a famous example of a technology transfer. So Ray Haroon won the very first Indianapolis 500 uh, mile race in 1911. One of the things was uh, the other competitors had riding mechanics, and so essentially two people would go around the entire circuit uh, for that 500 miles. The other one uh, watching out uh, for, for other competitors, looking at the, at the track surface, kind of being the more the, the passenger, making sure everything's okay while the driver, of course, steers uh, the vehicle. Uh, and so that adds extra weight. An extra person in the car is going to add extra weight. And so what Ray Haroon thought was, wow, I can put a mirror uh, up here on uh, right above my steering wheel, right above my, uh, my, my, uh, my cockpit, and I can essentially uh, see everything that I will need to see that that riding mechanic would, would be able to see. So essentially he lightened the car by reducing the need for the riding, rider mechanic, and here technology transfer and innovation obviously becomes over time a mass uh, widely used product, the rear view mirror, which we can find in every single vehicle. The biggest critics of motorsport complain that the sport is just burning carbon for the fun of it. So cars going around in circles, just essentially polluting the air just for fun. But as we know, as we're going to find out, the automobile industry is actually going to be driving the innovation that improves uh, the, the pollutants, uh, that reduces the pollutants, I should say, from automobiles 
from those technology transfers and motor support. And a video that I like to show is called Carbon Nation. And this is just the trailer. It's a movie called Carbon Nation. But why I like it is it's very much fair and balanced. It's not the people kind of saying, oh, global warming is something that's human cause. And it's not the opposite. The people say, no, it's not. It just takes a nice middle of the road stance. And so go ahead and take a look at this video. Here's a project that's supported by the uh, U.S. Department of Energy uh, using very, very intelligent people from the Argonne National Laboratory. So essentially what they've done is developed this green racing project in which the goals of the project is to overall reduce our reliance on uh, 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 oil uh, and fossil fuels. Uh, and so what they're what they're doing is working very much at the grassroots level. Uh, and so what they have done is they've actually raced the car uh, using a whole lot less fuel, uh, and that car is essentially winning races. And so they're using the competitive platform of a motorsport event, an automobile race, uh, to then showcase this new technology and showcase how ethanol, straight from uh, the pumps uh, that you know any passenger car. Uh, uses can actually be used in place of racing fuel, which causes which is costs much more uh, than uh, than ethanol from the pump. Uh, and so here we can see an idea that's also saving money, but also reducing environmental impact. Now I'll try to find the video called "Green Race Cars Speed Into Focus at Argonne" that highlights a lot of what I just described. Here's one of the leading engineers uh, with the Green Racing Project, Forrest Jellick, uh, and key to him is he used to work for uh, General Motors, and so he has this history working in research and development with General Motors. Now he's working on this, uh, this uh, project at uh, Argonne, uh, and so here you can also see his connections with uh, sports car racing as well. And so here's an example of someone who's bringing technologies, who's taking the, the opportunity to use a motorsport event both to test out new ideas, but also to promote new ideas to uh, greater audiences. Now I want you to take a look at this video called, Is This the Year That Green Racing Finally Takes Off? In this video here, called Alan McNish Explains the 2013 Audi R18 e-tron Quattro, uh, take a look at this video to see the extreme high-tech innovation that goes into the production of this particular racing vehicle. That 2013 Audi competed head-to-head -head in the 24-hour Le Mans with this particular Toyota here. So essentially what we have is we have the competition spurred new innovations, caused both teams to work even harder, come up with even newer ideas to then beat the competitor. So here, this is a hybrid vehicle in which it has a large amount of electricity that powers the vehicle compared to the traditional cars that run on diesel, gas, or petrol-powered vehicles. However, motorsport provides the opportunity to test out new ideas. And so now let's look at that vehicle flying through the air in this particular 24 Hours of Le Mans Toyota 2012 crash video. In the particular video of that crash, you would have noticed the safety personnel there in the orange gear were extremely apprehensive, extremely cautious about coming up to this vehicle to tend to the driver. Why? Well, this is a very powerful electric essentially lightning rod uh, with you know, potentially extremely harmful uh, electric shock uh, that it could provide the first person to touch it. So this is one of the you know, roles in which motorsport kind of introduces an idea, but also tests that idea to see actually if it could transfer to the public. So this electric car revolution that a lot of people think is uh, going to be the future well, what happens when these electric cars start wrecking? Uh, essentially, we're going to have to retrain our emergency personnel that comes up on an accident scene to you know, handle uh, these essentially these electric lightning rods uh, that can do a lot of shock uh, to uh, their, their, the first person or the people that come across them. And so once again, motorsport providing an opportunity to test out and learn from new ideas before those new ideas make it to the passenger car. Here we have a very tragic, extremely violent uh, uh, wreck in which the racing series took this, they learned from it, uh, and because of this, the racing series is going to become even safer. So here, once again, 
Motorsport provides an opportunity for automobile manufacturers to test out new ideas, but it also enhances safety over time. Everything becomes more safe when we go to the racetrack because of previous unsafe accidents. Another opportunity for uh, manufacturers to use motorsport is in coming up with new technologies, in particular regarding efficiency. So here we see a vehicle called the Delta Wing in which it's reduced the weight considerably of the car. And so because they've reduced the weight considerably of the car, the engine doesn't have to be as powerful. So essentially the engine uh, is more efficient, it's smaller. So what we've got going on here is the use of new technologies, in this case, lighter technologies that eventually could make their way to the passenger car. But before that happens, why not test it out to see you know, what are the chances of this sucker rolling over? Uh, and so this is a new idea, but you know, is it susceptible to uh, other uh, problems that aren't known uh, at the moment? Now I'll introduce the third key stakeholder into this interrelated web uh, of key stakeholders in the motorsport industry, and that is the entrance. The entrance are also the racing teams, including the drivers uh, and also the team owner. Construction constructors and suppliers or the automobile industry uses the entrance to then test out or drive or prepare their particular ideas, uh, their particular products uh, in the competitive platform of a racing series or a racing event. Uh, the entrance, of course, benefit from the free, let's say, no, relatively free, I don't know call it free, but the technology provided by the constructors and suppliers. And so we can see that mutual beneficial relationship in which the entrants can go faster or do better when they rely on new technologies that outperform other technologies uh, that come from the constructors and suppliers. And so oftentimes entrants help to come up with the innovations that are then uh, later brought to the passenger vehicle. Of course, the entrants, the relationship to the sanctioning body in, in terms of the sanctioning body provides the rules uh, in which they have to adhere to. Uh, and so the sanctioning body is that governing body, uh, but of course the sanctioning body couldn't exist <clears throat> if it didn't have entrance, if it didn't have race teams uh, and drivers. Now at the global level, oftentimes the entrance are the OEMs that we've already talked about. For example, uh, we showed beforehand Audi uh, is a presenter or is the entrant uh, of, a, of a vehicle and the uh, uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. Uh, we used that previous example. Uh, but maybe at the more local level, uh, we could think of Andretti Racing as a particular racing team or an entrant. That is, they're, uh, you know, they're entered into multiple sanctioning bodies more than just uh, what they're traditionally known for uh, with IndyCar. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the entrance uh, because this is typically what most people think all of motorsport is, is racing teams and drivers. And the point of this lecture is, no, it's a whole lot more than just that. So here's a particular, uh, that figure that we use throughout this uh, discussion in which we see entrance listed. The fourth and final key component or stakeholder in the production of motorsport are the races or the events that are also we can lump into uh, with this particular uh, group the venues or the circuits in which they take place. And so essentially the events provide that marketable spectacle, that wow event uh, that's going to draw people uh, to watch these cars race uh, or watch a particular driver race uh, and so on. Uh, and so the sanctioning body then chooses particular events. So you can see that mutual beneficial relationship between sanctioning bodies and events as they fill out their particular racing series calendar. And so they decide which venues or uh, events they should uh, include in their particular schedule each year. Uh, whereas the events also provide construction suppliers and the entrance <clears throat> the opportunity to compete head to head with each other. So once again we can see that whole uh, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. The events provide that particular platform. Another key term, another key thing to think about with events is the role of the event promoter. And so every single race has an event promoter which is essentially an integrator of various service companies. And so it's more than just some that goes out and cheers out promote we're promoting this race come see this race it's more than just that the event promoter also oversees the various event suppliers whether it be the construction of the venue the media that it's at uh, attending uh, and, and, and uh, doing the press coverage of a particular event fundraising marketing uh, the insurance of the event uh, event management and so at our 
particular university, we have a tourism and event, event management degree. And so those event management students oftentimes are working with these local motorsport events as well. Of course, hospitality and cater, uh, catering. Um, so if you go to the Indi uh, Indianapolis 500, you see a lot of suites in which those require caterers. And so those are also a uh, key to uh, the production of a motorsport event. Add to that public services like police, fire, safety, security, and all that. And so we can see an event promoter is just more than someone going out promoting a race. It's someone that has to integrate all these various components in the production of that particular marketable spectacle. Here from that chapter, uh, we see examples of events and e event suppliers that are included in that particular reading. Another thing most people don't realize is that motorsport venues, as far as their types, vary considerably. And so we have six different examples of different venue types that we're going to go through. And we'll begin with one that we see the most common, and that's the privately owned venue. Uh, and our best example of this is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And so it's not owned by the government. Uh, it's not owned by the city. Uh, it is owned by a private uh, individual company, and we know that most of that company uh, involves the Holman family, uh, which for the last uh, 20, you know, last 50 to 60 years has been an integral part of privately owning the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This differs from uh, Daytona International Speedway, in which it's a, actually a publicly traded company. So you can actually go out there and buy stock in the Daytona International Speedway, quite different than the privately owned uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now we go to Barber Motorsports Park, uh, just uh, uh, east of Birmingham, Alabama, and it's an example of actually a racing venue that's a nonprofit. Uh, and so here it's a venue that's also has a lot of art uh, along with it. It's also where you see uh, a driving school. And so in terms of here, uh, this particular venue, they don't make money. Uh, and so any money they make is returned uh, back to the local community. Now we'll go over to the west coast uh, of, the, of the United States where we have a racing venue that's owned by the state of California, and that's Laguna Seca. Another type of venue is one in which it's owned by the actual government or the country in which that racing venue resides. We're going to see more and more of these, I would argue, popping up over time, particularly there at the global level. And so you think about those new uh, Formula One venues. A lot of those are at government-owned racing venues. This one here is the Nürburgring uh, in Germany, uh, home to uh, you know historically many, many uh, uh, legendary races. Uh, but today it's got the 24 hours of Nürburg, uh, and it's very, very, very uh, popular race, particularly amongst Germans. A final example would be uh, one in which the city owns uh, the particular racing venue. And these are pretty much are going to be those uh, venues uh, that are uh, temporary street circuits. And so uh, in the case of IndyCar, they race uh, at several different temporary street circuits. Uh, one example would be Long Beach, a very famous race. But in this case, we're looking at St. Pete, uh, Florida. And so this is St. Petersburg, Florida, in which the city owns the racing venue. And so they're the ones that are kind of uh, in charge of setting up but also dismantling uh, this uh, this temporary street circuit uh, during the, uh, the the one weekend uh, that they race here each year. This here is hoping to showcase the fact that motorsport varies uh, as far as across our space. So essentially at the local level there's tons of participants, uh, there's many spectators of these particular events. Uh, and so at the local or grassroots level, we're going to find a variety uh, of events, we're going to find a variety of sanctioning bodies, but as we work our way up the pyramid, as we work our way as far as a broader region, you're going to so find fewer and fewer entrants, fewer and fewer events, uh, and fewer and fewer uh, sanctioning bodies involved. And so at the global level, there's just a few global level events, just a few global level sanctioning bodies, for example, Formula One or uh, the uh, Indianapolis 500 uh, would be both examples of more global uh, events uh, and global racing series. Uh, there's just a few of them. And so the moral to the story is what this is also showing is the fact that those key stakeholders that I just mentioned also vary in terms of are they at the local level or are they at the global level or somewhere in between.
And a great example of the local level is this picture I took uh, of a karting event uh, on the streets of Hagerstown, Indiana, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so here at the grassroots level, we've got grassroots participants. Uh, we've got, you know, obviously, suppliers and constructors of carts, racing teams, typically parents. Uh, and so the particular event here, uh, obviously not going to have the money involved that we'd find with a global level event, but there's several of these local events all throughout the particular area, country. And so we're going to find more of these events than we are those global elite level events. Up until now, the focus of this discussion has been only on the key stakeholders involved in the production of motorsport. Now we're going to focus in on the distribution uh, or the media, TV, internet, press coverage of motorsport. We think of this as the distribution being absolutely critical in how constructors and suppliers can promote their ideas or their products to larger audiences. Further, entrants or racing teams and their drivers can promote themselves to larger audiences using uh, media and TV coverage. Further, sanctioning bodies can also enhance their particular racing series by attracting more and more viewers. Same goes for events which can also attract more people to want to attend the event because they're watching it on the television. Um, so distribution, like I said, it's going to be including all media involved in dissemination of motorsport events to larger audiences. Further, we think of this distribution today as extremely dynamic. What does that mean? It's constantly changing. For example, uh, I had the opportunity to purchase the very last National Speed Sport News as a newspaper. Um, so this company was historically, uh, every week or two weeks, you'd get an update, great racing uh, paper, uh, kind of the updates of all the various racing forms in the United States. But no longer were people buying newspapers and magazines, especially when two weeks later, I finally got the information about a race that I've already watched. How they've adapted, now National Speed Sport News has been rebranded, and they're now adding new information constantly to the particular iPad app. Uh, and so you can go there and then purchase the content, and that content's up to date, and it's essentially almost real time. So we, here we can see how the distribution has changed, and how this one particular company that's involved in motorsport, uh, this particular segment of journalism, let's say, has adapted to the changing environment. Further, uh, I just watched a 24-hour race from Dubai, uh, a sports car race, uh, and it was in Dubai, which is a country in the, or an area of the Middle East. And so while I was here in the middle of nowhere, Indiana, I was watching it on my iPad, crystal clear coverage, great radio co or great uh, uh, broadcasting coverage via the Internet. And so that's a new way in which motorsport events are being broadcasted or exposed to larger audiences. Further, we're going to see once again this, this situation where at different levels we see different participants in uh, the distribution of, of these particular events. And so at the global level, you're going to see those global media companies uh, like, for example, Fox uh, or the Associated Press, which are going to be involved in the dissemination of that information. Whereas at the local level, of course, you're going to find more local news and in some respects, no coverage at all for those very much those grassroots, extremely localized events. And once again, we relate these ideas, these key stakeholders, to this graphic from that published textbook that covers the motorsport industry. One way to showcase the interrelatedness of the various components to a motorsport event is looking at television ratings between the Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500. Not going in too much of the history uh, of either of these sports, uh, but over, as this indicates, over the last 10, 15 years, the Daytona 500 has increased in popularity compared to the Indianapolis 500. But we can denote some particular patterns related to the entrance involved in the race. So in 1995, what happened was we had the open wheel split. So a lot of the big name teams that historically competed in the Indy 500 weren't competing that particular year. And we really didn't see them for four or five years. And so famous teams like Team Ganassi, uh, Team Penske, uh, Andretti weren't involved there in the late 90s. And so because there weren't those drivers that were going to attract viewers, you can see how the television ratings declined. And so, of course, what that means is you're going to have 
various constructors and suppliers may be considering not getting involved with that racing series because it's just not as popular as it used to be or it's not as popular as another racing series, the NASCAR and their Daytona 500. Further, we can see the role of how in 2001 a lot of those race teams came back, but then in 2005 we see a spike in that red line for the Indianapolis 500. That spike is totally related to a particular driver, and so we can see the role of entrance and that driver being Danica Patrick. And so we can see the role of individuals in, in causing a racing series to become even more popular or distribute to an even larger audience. And so because of that corporate sponsorship, constructors and suppliers were more apt to come back to IndyCar because of the popularity of that particular driver. But then we can see over time that that driver, Danica, has kind of lost her appeal and of course is no longer racing in the series. Here I take that graphic and I kind of showcase how these different key stakeholders in the case of this IndyCar and the graphic it just showcased how they're very much interrelated with each other. Once again, we reintroduce this pyramid to kind of showcase the idea that those global elite level events are covered by extremely large media uh, organizations. So, of course, like we think about Fox uh, as far as promoting uh, a global level Formula One motorsport or MotoGP events uh, by having Fox cover those uh, and broadcast those particular races. Also, the Associated Press, we could think of as a global level body covering global level racing series. Where then if we go down to the national level, uh, and so national level, for instance, that national speed sport news covers overwhelmingly national level events. And so they might talk a little bit about Formula One, but they're going to be focusing more on IndyCar, NASCAR, uh, uh, AMA, uh, and a variety of national level uh, racing series. Uh, further, we work our way down. Of course, we're going to have a variety of regional coverage, and lots of that tied to the particular form of motorsport in that particular region. But the challenge at the bottom is local level, club level, or grassroots level, how do they promote their they're albeit, you know, it could be exciting racing series, how they promote to larger audiences. Because they are not going to have that platform that the larger uh, events, the national and global level events, as far as distributing their content to large audiences. And so, how can they overcome these challenges, I ask? One way in which these grassroots level uh, racing series can promote themselves is by making super cool videos uh, that people can then download and watch whenever they want. So obviously this coverage isn't live. You're not going to be able to watch the Indiana Sprint Week live, but by watching this video, you're going to be wowed by the excitement, all the various senses uh, that you will experience when you attend uh, one of these particular events. And so a local level uh, example we can find here with the Indiana Sprint Week video. If I ask those of you in this course who are, for the most part, motorsport enthusiasts, why you like racing, you'll give me all kinds of reasons related to engine technology, engine performance, aerodynamics, the speed, the cornering abilities, you know, the, the, the sports cars, kind of the Corvette versus Porsche, uh, all those various things. But for the casual fan, the person who goes to the track once a year, the person who might watch one race a year on TV, for them, they want to be entertained. And so when you think about the motorsport as far as an entire industry, we also have to include the fact it's an entertainment industry. So here we have an all-encompassing graphic of how I describe the motorsport industry in terms of its start off, its production, the origins, the core of the sport, and then over time the media involved in spreading. So we think about those of you who are journalism majors, that's where you come into the fold. And then also consumption, we've got the spectators, participants, and viewers. And so it's all about increasing the number of spectators is only going to grow the distribution. It's going to only grow or even cause more reasons for TV. TV to want to cover your particular racing series if more people are demanding it, more people are watching it. For example, the Chili Bowl. The Chili Bowl is a is a is an indoor race in Tulsa that happens every January. And this is a race that over time more and more people want to watch. It sells out and over time, so now it's on it's on cable network a TV. Might be hard to find, but it's it's still uh, it's now being broadcasted to larger audiences. And so that's all due to the desire of more people wanting to watch that race. And so you can see how all this relates, but we have the core of the motorsport being still those key st stakeholders we see on the left-hand side. But just like the distribution is dynamic, it's changing, we also have consumption habits are changing. And one simple way to showcase this is a new statistic in January of 2014 in which 3 billion people in the next 20 years across the world will join the middle class. What that means is more and more people three billion of them, are going to be now capable 
of watching a race on television because they're going to have access to TV. They're going to be capable of, of purchasing a motorized vehicle, so thus relate like we all can to, uh, you know, to, to motorsport because we have our own cars. And so you're going to get more and more people that are potential consumers for a variety of racing series. And so whether it be at the regional, national, global uh, levels, you're going to see how this is going to play a key role in maybe growing the sport or maybe not. It just depends on how these people consume in the next 20 years. And so I summarize, I use the consumption. We can see it's the last component to this motorsport value chain from our Motorsport Going Global textbook. Here we have the 2014 Harris Poll, uh, which looks at fans uh, in the United States uh, and looks at what their favorite sport is. Simply ask them that simple question. And they've been doing this for a long, long time. In fact, since 1985, they've been keeping this table uh, and keeping track of changes throughout time. And we can see auto racing in the United States is the fourth most popular sport. Uh, we can see some trends there as well. Uh, since 1985, it has actually grown auto racing. Uh, but if we look at a more recent snapshot, since 2005, you can see how that number has gone down from 11% to 7% today. Uh, but what's going on there is that for sure the growth of pro football. Uh, pro football has definitely grown, and so that's taken a lot of the fan interest in other sports, including auto racing. More recently, you've seen other sports start to emerge, and so what's happening is there are more options for the, for the average American uh, in terms of sporting interests. Uh, soccer is definitely growing, but you know golf definitely has grown, especially with Tiger Woods. Uh, you know, basketball always been popular. Uh, ice hockey, now that the NHL is back in existence, quite popular. And so you have, you know, UFC, MMA, uh, which is even on here, uh, which is increasingly more popular. We got global sports that we're now more aware of. For example, people watch cricket now in the United States. Go figure, cricket's more than just a little bug. And so what's going on here is we got changes ahead. But if we look at the, you know, optimism in racing is that we are still the fourth most popular sport in the country. Also what the Harris Poll does is they look at the top four and kind of look at some characteristics. And so they have data on the demographics of the people who uh, participate in their poll. And so they can start to find out traits and characteristics of different sports. And you can see down at the bottom, the average auto racing fan, its characteristics uh, in terms of being a little bit more rural, uh, as far as politically, more conservative, which those kind of go hand in hand. Uh, also a little bit lower education level and a little bit lower income level. And so what the, we can also see on the right hand side, the lowest category is essentially what auto racing is not. It uh, doesn't have a lot of college grads compared to other sports. It uh, doesn't have a lot of household incomes above 75k. And doesn't have a lot of millennials, which are young people. And this is a big problem going forward how to attract the next generation. And the next generation right now is millennials. And as we can see, uh, we do not see large numbers of millennials finding interest in auto racing compared to previous generations. So why? What's going on there? But we know that this isn't a full, complete, accurate snapshot of auto racing. There are the various forms of auto racing. There's the different levels, grassroots level to international level. If you look at the Formula One or maybe sports car or IndyCar fan bases, you're probably going to find more college grads. You're going to find a wealthier fan compared to maybe MotoGP, Supercross, Monster Trucks, and NASCAR, in which you see maybe more of the typical characteristics we see of the NASCAR fan or the auto racing fan. More rural, more southern, uh, more conservative lower income uh, and so we know that within the sport there is still quite variation and would say differences in the demographics from one racing series to the next and when we look at racer magazine north america's number one auto racing publication and we can see as far as the kind of characteristics of the people that are really interested in racing especially in this country so much that they would actually get a subscription to a racing specific magazine uh, and we can see overwhelmingly male, a little higher income maybe than what we saw on the previous uh, table, uh, but some other characteristics here in terms of what they call psychographics, uh, and also kind of categories as far as what people purchase or what people buy, what people click when they're on the Racer Magazine digital page. I've talked about the race fan, I've talked about the journalists, I've talked about the person who produces the tires, the engines. 
All that's great, but what's key to the understanding the motorsport industry, by far, is the role of money. So I ask you, tell me, why is money so important in motorsport? And when you think about that question, relate that to a particular key stakeholder. For example, why is it for entrance? Why is it so important that they have money? Why is it so important for events that they're funded? Why is it so important to the sanctioning body that they produce money? And so when you think about those core questions, uh, those key questions, uh, you know, relate those to the stakeholders. Finally, in sum, this is the motorsport industry according to me.